Isn't God good? Get your Bible out if you want to follow along. We're going to do communion. Verse 23, For I received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do remember some me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament, my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you will show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Let's pray. Father, Miss first. How I many here may have had an attitude this week that was not the best in the world? How I many had any actions in here this week that may not have been the best? Here's what you're going to do. I want you to raise your hands up, and I want you to just ask God to forgive you for it. Just say, God, i got to have some help because I can't do it on my own. Amen? Father, we love you. We praise your name. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, God, for all you do for us, all you say for us, Lord, all the things that you've always done in the past, the present, and the future. God, we know, Lord, that our sins have been paid for yesterday, today, tomorrow, and forever. We know, God, that we're going to one day be there with you, Lord, in the name of Jesus, to serve in eternity. I ask you right now, Lord, to open our minds, open our hearts, help us to see, to know, to understand what you've got for us this day. And help us to celebrate communion. Celebrate it because we know that you're an awesome God. You're a powerful God. And you got everything, absolutely everything under control. And we thank you for it. In the name of Jesus we pray. The church said, Amen. He took the bread. He broke it. And after he broke it, he blessed it and said, Take it, this is my body, which is broken for you. That same night, he took the cup and he blessed it and said, This is my blood shed for you. Drink it in remembrance of me. Come, let us join at the Lord's table.
I was asking God, I really was, I was asking Lord, that you know, I'd rather be preaching on something a whole lot better than this as far as, you know, fun and, and having fun about the holidays, which I normally do. I preach on the holidays and preach on Thanksgiving and all that. And all I can keep hearing is prepare them for what's coming in the new year. <laughs> so, get ready for what's coming in the new year. I know there's going to be growth, but in order for there to be growth, if we're not careful, we'll all be guilty of spiritual abortion. People come in and we don't know what to do, we don't know how to handle it, or we're not prepared our own self. And so instead of leading them and helping them when they come in, we, we, we actually push them away and deter them from serving God. So it's very important that we have ourselves in, a, in, a, in the right place, in our, in our mind, in our heart, in our spirit. I did want to do something that is Thanksgiving, and, and, and some of this is the only goal. This is my favorite of all times. Science you ever did at Thanksgiving. How many ever did at Thanksgiving? We got three people that confess. Four, five, <laughs> seven. Five people that confess. The rest of y'all will pray for you. Ready? I ate so much over the holidays, over Thanksgiving. It's hard, but I decided to quit cold turkey. <laughs> I know. This is the old rule I told you this is old. This is so old. First time I heard it, I laughed so hard to kick the slat out my crib. Ready? <laughs> <laughs> You know you've ever did it when you get grass stains on your behind after a walk and you never sit down. <laughs> All right, that was better. Come on. All right, that was better. <laughs> the rash burns on your stomach turns out to be steering wheel burn. <laughs> <laughs> Representatives from the Butterball Hall of Fame called you twice. <laughs> Finally, you receive a sumo wrestler application in your email. All right, I see y'all in a playful mood today. All right, so like I said, this is not probably one of the, one of the most, uh, well, this is not necessarily the most uh, favorite of all things we preach, especially during the holidays, but I can tell you, it's going to be one of the most powerful. It's already been powerful. We've already done two weeks. This is our third week, and we've taken it. We let the plow down. Y'all said let the plow down, Pastor. Okay, I'm glad you asked me that. Now we're ready. Now, it's so important that we have our mind in the right mindset in order for God to use us. And once we get our mind in the right mindset, then we can do something for God that we might even think there's no way in the world God could use me for this. There's no way God could use me. And as we begin to see, as we begin to crucify ourselves, the doors open wide in so many different ways. So, so, so here we go. Galatians, get your Bible out. Turn to Galatians chapter 2. Stand for the reading of the word. Galatians chapter 2. Verse 20. For I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness has come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Just for your hands this way, ask God for a special anointing and touch. Father, we know you're already here. We know, God, you're already moving in our midst. I know, God, that, 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 that this is a wonderful time of year. There's good things going on, and there's celebration going on. We we're thanking you for the things that you've done in our life just this week. We're thanking you, and we know that everything is cool. And, Lord, I know, God, that you've got this. And I know, Lord, that today marks the one-year anniversary of burying Bethany. And I ask you right now, Lord, just to let her continue just to rest in your arms. And I have to, I have to worry about that big C word anymore. And God, I thank you for that. And Lord, I know, God, that you got all things together and you got all things awesome. And we trust you. Lord, in the name of Jesus, this day is yours. And we thank you for it. Church said? Amen. On the way down, tell somebody the past is behind us. The future is ahead of us. God is with us. And nothing shall be impossible. Amen. Now, just, just about three or four slides just to bring some continuity, and then we're going right into the day because this time the plow is going to go down really hard. Matter of fact, you'll probably start saying, pull the plow up some, Pastor. Pull the plow up some. 
Amen. Too deep, too deep, too deep. Amen. It's like the bullfrogs in my backyard after that bad storm we had. They were singing knee deep, knee deep, knee deep. About two days after the storm, they were singing too deep, too deep, too deep. Okay, y'all still ain't here to play. Here we go. All right. <laughs> Here's Satan's strategy. Satan desires, remember, this is just a couple of slides just to bring some continuity. Satan desires to affect your thinking. Y'all say he's messing with my head. Then he wants to affect your life. Say he's messing with my whole life. And then he wants to affect your relationship. Say, say, say get out of my relationship, Satan. Alright. But he wants to get in all of these in order that he can affect your life. He can affect your relationships. And he can affect the way you think. A lot of times we have stinking thinking and thinking it's because of somebody else. And really what's going on is we're the ones that have the stinking thinking. So here we go. And remember just a couple of, couple of slides. Paul saw the potential and the devastation of trying to face two directions at the same time. They were trying to please God and they were trying to please people. I'm here to tell you, if you're trying to please God and you're trying to please people, you will lose every time. Look at somebody and say, you'll lose every time. Amen. Amen. So, 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 he knew that it was a peril of a divided heart. James 1 8 says, a double minded man is unstable in all his ways. It's destructive because now you're mixing, mixing faith with fear and you're <clears throat> taking the cross and mixing with religion and it doesn't work. And it also brings a big distraction because you're looking both ways. So here's the two. The first week, here's what we did the first week. All right, ready? Come on up here, buddy. There you are. The first week, we're talking about the direction. He's only facing one direction. It's a proper look. It was a focused look. Not looking to the left. Not looking to the right. Nine, uh, Luke 9, 51 says he set his face to danger. His face toward Jerusalem. He knew what awaited there, so he still he went. Isaiah 50 and 7, he set his face like a flint, hard, impassive, determined, fixed. And, 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 and shall not be ashamed. Joshua 1 and 7, we read that. Don't look to the left, don't look to the right. God's got something for you. That's the first week. The second week, and there, there you go. See, see the blind of the tribe of Judah up in the sky? There we go. The decision, they're not going back. There's a made, the mind's made up, their mind is motivated, their mind is maintained. It's so easy to lose heart when you're right there at the edge of seeing something come to pass. Isaiah 26 says he will, and 3 says he will keep us in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. That word uh, mind stayed means to lean upon and to lean upon for strength. And uh, perfect peace means peace, peace. Complete peace. Peace in everything. All your circumstances, everything. It's just amazing when God's got everything under control. Now here we go. Y'all say, y'all say, lower it down, Pastor. Lower it down. Good, y'all already asked me to, so now you, now you can't say anything when it gets tough. Ready? Here we go. The death. The death. After you made a decision not to turn back. After you got a direction, you're looking in the right direction, you made a decision not to turn back. And those can seem hard, but this is the hardest of all, but it's the most liberating of all. Death. Death to his own plans. It's a personal death. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, Present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God. Present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God. Now this is, this is a typical uh, or a picture of the sacrificial altar. And what it represents. Number one, it represents dedication. You present your bodies. I'm not going to pick you up. God says I'm not going to pick you up and throw you on the altar. I'm not going to bind you and put you on the altar. I need you to climb up on the altar on your own. Wow. One more time. When they took the altar, when they, when they, when they were bound, binding, uh, they would bind the animal and then put it up on the altar. God says, I don't want to bind you. I want you to willfully, in your mind, get up and crawl on that altar. Be dedicated to what you're doing. Then, be determined, said, present your bodies a living 
sacrifice. Now here's the hard part. It's easy for a dead sacrifice to stand on the altar. But what about a living sacrifice? God, I, I, I want to be up there, but do you realize there's things I want to do? Do you realize there's things I want to say? Do you realize there's some other stuff that I really want to be doing right now? Can I serve you later? Can I serve you when I get old and gray? Can I serve you when I'm just about, you know, about a full of a banana peel? And I know I'm getting ready to go out of here. Can I serve you then? And God says, no, I need you to climb on it now. I don't need to bind you to put you on it. You need to climb up on it. And then once you get up on it, I need you to stay on it. Wow. And then there's the desire that you can prove that good and acceptable will of the Lord for the right reasons. So now, remember, God wants us to climb on the altar. God wants us to stay on the altar. And there's a reason behind it. Because when we stay on that altar, then God can communicate to us in a way that he cannot communicate any other way. So, so watch this now. I, got, I broke it down into four levels. I want you to watch this. Look. I, I love that, that little sign there. Are you ready to grow? How many is ready to grow? Yeah, yeah. All right. Y'all are so excited about it. How many is ready to grow? Yeah, yeah. All right. Here we go. All right. Get ready. The first level of Christian growth. And see if you can find yourself in here. Don't, don't, do not point at anybody. Do not yank them on their arm. Do not go, see, I told you. Just be quiet. Look at it. And then I get to your part, not the people around you go, uh-huh. The first level of Christian growth is a lot of me and a little of you, God. Wow. A lot of me and a little of you, God. Now, how, how do I know if I'm in that position that there's a lot of me and a little of God? I'm still serving God. I'm still going to go to heaven. Everything's going to be good. But I'm going to find myself limited on this earth on how God can use me. I find myself limited on this earth on how I can even talk to people because there's a lot of me in it. Here's what, what you might hear somebody say. There's a lot of me and a little of you in it. Here's what they'd say. They don't appreciate me. They don't recognize me. Wow. God bless you. That reminds me, we need to pray. Uh, Wendy took her boy to the hospital this morning. He's got a rash on his arms and his legs and his, and his face is turning red and there's a little swelling going on. So he's, we need to pray for him right now. I meant to say a while ago. Lord, I thank you right now for your ability to heal my brother, to touch him, to know that you've got this, and as mom and daddy know that you've got this, Lord. Trust you 100% to take care of this house or whatever he's allergic to. They fix it, they find it, they fix it, and he comes home good. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So here we go. Again, how, how can I tell? Well, number one, these people are opinionated. Wow. They got an answer for everything. If they don't have an answer, they will say something about your answer. They're opinionated. It's one thing to have a good understanding of things. It's another thing to understand, period. But if there's a lot of me and a little of him, now all of a sudden I'm thinking nobody recognizes what I do. They don't see what I'm doing. And then when somebody starts talking about something, you have to make sure you put your two cents worth in. Wow. Not only that, but these people are easily offended. I remember back in the years, a long, long time ago, when I was like that. And I found myself getting so aggravated. And I understand so aggravated that instead of working for God, I was too busy trying to figure out how I could get in more. How, how, God, how can I, how can you touch me like you're touching them? How can, how can I receive the Lord that person's God? How can I do this and how can I do that? God, why is it? First level, a lot of me and a little of you, God. And please, if you're writing down notes, please write this down. Matter of fact, what I'm giving you to you right now is so intense. I want you to pay careful attention, listen carefully, take notes, and see if you can find yourself. You may be in one, two, three, or all four of them. It just depends on who you're with and what the situation is. Number two, some of me and some of you, God. How can you tell if you're 
in that some of me, some of you, God. Here's one thing you like to say. I'll do this for you, God, if you do that for me. We're going to bargain with him. How are you going to bargain with him? Some of me, some of you, God. Discipleship becomes a trade-off. Okay, I'll serve you, God, as long as I can be seen. I'll serve you, God, as long as I can get that new job. I'll serve you, God, as long as they treat me good. I'll serve you, God, as long as my marriage is perfect. I'll serve you, God, as long as this person is doing this, this person is doing that. I'll serve you, God, as long as on my job they, they give me a raise and everything's cool. Really? So let me just go one more time. I just love it. I hate it, but I love it. First level, a lot of me. Let's just go over here. We'll just do it this way. Ready? Here we go. First level. There's a lot of me, and there's a little of you, God. Second level, there's some of me and some of you, God. Now get ready for the third level. Ready? A little of me and a lot of you, God. I have to confess, I find myself at level three many times. If you don't, that's fine. If you're at level four all the time, great. But I find myself, I got over one and two, but three keeps, keeps nagging at me. Get ready. Lord, I got these few areas. show teeth, you just can't show tail. Amen. <laughs> Alright, ready? Growth has started but still more is needed. As long as you're on this earth, you're going to grow. And when you cease to grow, number one, you cease to lead. Number two, when you cease to grow, you actually cease to actually have an awesome chance of working good for God because now you're stagnant. I was watching uh, some program on Africa yesterday and it said there was a bush. This bush, it was a like a tumbleweed. And it was buried in some sand and the wind started blowing and the sand blew away from the, blew away from the bush and the bush started growing around. They called it the resurrection plant. And so I got interested. They said this bush has probably been dead for 100 years. I said, wow, talk about a tumbleweed. It's blown across the desert, and eventually it gets blown into a place where there's a little bit of water. And as soon as there's a little bit of water, all of a sudden, all the dead, looks like it's coming back to life. And then the perfect storm is if now it rains on it, now it opens up and it drops seed, then it closes back up and it blows again. Within hours, more resurrection plants are growing. As they get up to some, some, some height, then they die and then they just seem to lose the roots and then they get blown all over the place. <laughs> and I see it. God, how many times have I been in that plan? Hmm. I watched that plan, it looked so awesome. Then it was dead. A little bit dead. A little bit dead. I said, God, please. Nowhere in your word did you say we're going to be like the resurrection plan. You said we're going to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. We were going to be like the palm tree. That's resilient. No matter how hard you push it, the harder you push it, the stronger it gets. That's why they flourish in hurricanes. Like the oak tree. But not a resurrection plant. I'm always 
be blown around by the wind and then I get a chance to look, work for a little while and I'm blown around in the wind again. No, that's not for me. Growth has started but still more needed. And number four, this is where I desire to be. And I like to say now that I'm going to be 60 years old in a few weeks, I'm here most of the time. But sometimes I do teeter-totter between four and three. You say, really? Why are you telling that? Because i got a lot more growing to do. Anybody here don't? Raise your hand. And the first thing we do is pray for that lying spirit. We all got things we got to grow. We got things we got to overcome. We got things we got to move forward in. We got to grow, grow, grow. And so this should be our desire. None of me in all of you, God. Now you say I can do all things through Christ. Or do all things as unto the Lord. Ready? Now, maturity has brought true change. Now this maturity brought true change, but now the flesh is truly crucified. Jesus is Lord and he's in control. And I want to stop at this lesson for just a minute. Peace and power come to us because we become his conduit. Years ago, I remember putting out a, back on 98.9 or 98.3, I remember putting out a devotion, are we a conduit or are we a container? If you're a container for God, that's good you're catching the stuff, but that's all you're doing is catching it. You're just full of it. A lot of times you say, you know, oh, uh, uh, I'm not being fed because you're so full that it just keeps coming out your mouth. As you try to put it, it comes back out because you haven't got rid of what's in you. A container actually doesn't advertise good for God. But a conduit, God gives you because as I give to you, you'll just put it out. Whatever I give you, you'll put it out. Whatever I do, you're going to do. If I bless you physically, it's going to be put out this way. If I bless you financially, it's going to come out this way. If I bless you emotionally, it's going to come out this way. I had one of the guys in B5 the other day. He looked at me and he said, uh, you're 60 years old. I said, thank you for reminding me of that. And he said, uh, don't you think you ought to be going down to Florida and just retire? You've done enough for God. And I said, what? And he was trying to convince me. I said, dude, don't even go there. I said, I ain't even got started. And he said, you know what? I can see you now, 90 years old, coming in here doing the same thing. I said, I hope so. I said, I'll never plan on retiring. And, 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 and I thought about that mentality. You see, let me ask you a question. Do you look at church? Do you look at your relationships? Do you look at your job? We're talking about maturity in the Lord. In level four. Do you look at your church, your relationships, your job as a cruise ship or a battleship? And when I say battleship, I'm not talking about because you're always fighting somebody. That's what I'm talking about. Do you look at the church? I'll just stay with the church for a moment. Do you look at this place as a cruise ship or a battleship? Because if it's a cruise ship, now my focus is all on me. If this is a cruise ship, now I'm trying to find a way to get my needs met. If it's a cruise ship, I'm going to defend myself. The same way in any relationships I've got, my job, whatever, I'm focusing on me, I'm focusing on my needs, and I'm defending those needs. Or is the church the battleship? The cruise ship is not prepared to fight. The cruise ship is not prepared to do hardly anything other than just entertain people. Just keep them entertained. Entertain them. And it's only for a limited time. And then they, they go back and what they're doing. The battleship, though, some of these guys stay out for six months at a time, even longer. These battleships are little cities. An aircraft carrier. Man, it is an awesome little city. Then now when you're on the battleship, I'm not focusing on me. I'm focusing on other people. I'm not focusing on my needs. 
I'm focusing on the needs of the people around me. I'm not focusing or trying to defend my needs now. I'm trying to defend the needs of others. So let me ask you. Do you look at one more time? And if it goes right here, none of me and all of you, God. God, I know I'm not on a cruise ship. I'm not focusing on me. I'm not focusing on my needs. I'm not defending my needs. But instead, I'm on a battleship. And I'm watching out for those around me. I'm taking care of their needs. And I'll defend them. So that's the four levels of your Christian growth. I told you it was gonna, we're going to dig deep today. We're digging deep. Y'all digging deeper? Y'all ready to go some more? Y'all say, dig it deeper, Pastor. Dig it deeper. <laughs> say, deeper, deeper, deeper. <laughs> All right, ready? Then it's good stuff. All right. This is going to get you ready for the following year coming up. The new year coming up. Number, number one is a personal death. Number two is a productive death. John 12, 24, 25 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat falls to the ground, it abideth alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. He that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Now, now let's just go ahead and talk about the mystery of the seed. That's how seed works. You just throw seed in the ground. And then it begins to germinate. It begins to germinate. Then the root comes out. When the root comes out, it starts getting root structure. And once it gets some root structure to it, then it begins to come out of the soil. And then at the same time, now you've got a root structure and you've got the, the plant up above. And the plant up above has these leaves and all this stuff to capture, to capture the sun and to capture the nutrients. Nutrients down below. Nutrients up above. Nutrients down below, you have to dig deep for. Nutrients up above, you got to get in the sun. So, 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 so here we go. Ready? Mr. of the Sea. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat, seed falls into the ground and dies. It abides alone. Now watch this. A seed is a vessel of potential. They found seeds in the pyramids that were thousands of years old. These seeds in the pyramids were just like they were thousands of years ago in the bags. Sent along with Pharaoh so he could plant when he got into the other side. They took these seeds and they put them in the ground. And as soon as they touch the ground, thousands of years old, as soon as the seeds touched the soil, guess what? They began to grow. Where am I going with that? Some of us. There may be areas in your life that you haven't grown in. There may be things in your life that you haven't grown in. There may be uh, on your job, like I said, a job, church, relationships, that, that you really haven't got your teeth sunk down deep. It's because you haven't died in those areas. The seed is still here, but it's just there. It's just a seed. You know, I like thinking of myself, you know, look, look, seed, watch this. Inside that seed is the DNA. Structured DNA inside that seed, whether it is uh, agricultural seed, whether it's human seed, it has all this information inside of it. This little generated, computer generated stuff inside of it, ready to go, and it's waiting for a chance to touch the soil so that it can begin to become what it was called to be. So it's in here, if we can realize a seed is a vessel of potential, but the potential is never discovered until it dies. But if it dies, the potential becomes realized. The potential only becomes realized, it multiplies. I did something here one day. I took, I took one ear of corn and, and I, I figured it out, got it all figured out. One ear of corn, 
or one stalk of corn, how many corn kernel, or how many, how many uh, 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 corn cobs or kernels of corn were on it, and then we figured out how many corn, how much corn was on there. We found out that one stalk of corn could feed. If you started just planting the stuff that came off that one stalk, you could feed multiple neighborhoods off of one, one corn plant from one seed. And it would just keep going over and over and over again and more and more people could be fed. You may feel right now that you're being buried. There's a difference in being uh, buried and planted. You may think the circumstances has buried you. That what you thought was going to happen will never happen. What you were looking forward to will never take place because you were buried. Let me just tell you something. Everybody in here I'm looking at is a seed. Don't look at somebody and say, I'm a seed. I'm a seed. I'm a seed. And when you feel like you've been buried, let me tell you something. You haven't been buried, you've been planted. Listen carefully. You haven't been buried, you've been planted, and because you've been planted, you may feel like you've had the dirt thrown over your face, but guess what? You're coming back. Look at this man say, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. So now, now here we're getting ready to close. I said, getting ready. Death, no plans of his own. No, it isn't a productive death, but it is a practice death. It says in Corinthians 15, 31, I die daily. Now the Corinthian church. We think that's, a pretty, that's got to be a pretty cool church because you hear about all the gifts of the Spirit and how God uses people and all this stuff going on in the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church, good Lord have mercy. That was like Peyton Place. There was so much stuff going on in that church. Although God was moving in a very powerful way, they had so much junk going on. So Paul said, dude, dudes and dudettes, we got to have some relief here. And here's how you have the relief. You crawl up on that cross and you die to self. You see, he was addressing people with un unhealthy. Let me get it back there. There we go. Come on back here. There you go. Unhealthy attitudes, spiritual pride, spiritual immaturity. Wow. Stuff was going on bad. So watch this. Here was the solution again. I love it. It's so awesome. Galatians 2 and 20. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And life which I not live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, before I close, I want you to just think about something. I want you to watch this. You notice that cross is empty, don't you? What does it say? Over the cross. Our cross. How many want to be used of God? I mean really used of God. How many want to see this year coming up the most awesome year this church has ever experienced? How many want to see it grow like you would, could not even believe? Here's what's got to happen. We've got to crawl up on that cross. Every last one of us. But it's easy for us to put somebody else up on the cross. It's easy for us to criticize somebody when they come down off the cross. It's easy if we don't think they're wearing the crown of thorns right. But guess what? My mind is not focused on anybody else. Not y'all. Not my wife. Not my children. Not the detention center. When it comes to this, you got to do it all, all alone. So when I crawl up on that cross, the very first thing that happens, watch this, it brings focus. I see beyond myself now. I see others. Had a guy was counseling a guy at the detention center. The guy's got, at the moment, he may happen when he gets out, but right now, we don't know when he's ever getting out. Bless his heart. He's got, whatever you get there, it's got to be sent through the manufacturer or through the prison system. You just can't send him something. 
You know, I like to send him some candy. I like to send him a Bible. We can't do that. You have to go through certain channels, and it has to be done by the publisher, or it has to be done uh, through the, the system that they have, where you send money to that system, and everybody gets virtually the same thing, whatever it is. And I was, I was, I was ministering to one of those guys in B5, and the guy started crying, and he put his arm around my shoulder, and he said, dude, he said, thank you so much. And he said, what can we do for you? And I said, man, you're doing it. You're getting better. He said, no, 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 no. We want to do something for you. And I said, no, 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 no. I'm not here for that. God's watching me. God's got this. He says, yeah, man. But he said, It's just so important to us. We see you giving out. I don't know if we can give back. And I, I thought about it. I think I said, here's a guy in prison that's got nothing. Can't even, don't, can't even use the pencil that he uses that long. And he can't even sharpen it himself. The guard has to come in and sharpen that pencil. He can't shave unless they're in there with him. And he's got to shave while they're watching. So then he can give the razors back. And all the razors are accounted for and all that stuff. And, and I thought about that. I said, here's a guy that's virtually confined like nobody's going to ever think of. And, and he's concerned about somebody else. And think about, I just thought about it. I said, and God, I can go, I'm going to walk out of here. I'm going to go wherever I want to. I'm going to go to my Starbucks, get me a coffee. I can go to a restaurant and get me something to eat. I can go to Walmart and fight the crowds. I can do whatever I want to. I can go home. I can take a nap. I can watch TV. And I said, God, do I have that same attitude? that guy has. He's restricted as much as possible. And he's trying to find a way to make a difference. Want to make a difference in my life. I said, you've already made a difference in my life. You don't have to do that. But all I can think of is, wow. We got so much. And then we crawled up on the cross and get our focus beyond ourselves and get it to others. So you crawl up on the cross. Now my focus is I see beyond myself. It says I'm crucified with Christ, never less I live. Yet now, now Christ lives in me. Watch this. Not only focus, when I crawl up on that cross, I find fulfillment. Because not only am I thinking about others, now I serve through Christ. Because I've died to self. As I've died to self, now I'm not me oriented. I'm not looking in the mirror all the time. I'm looking through a window and asking how, how can I change? A lot of Mother Teresa said, why don't you be the change you'd like to see in the world? You be that change. If you're that change, you'll start seeing that change. And then finally, when I crawl up on that cross, I find the force. Because now, I live through Christ's power. I'm not living on my own now. I'm living through a power that's greater than I am. So although I'm on that cross, and although it's tough, I quit worrying about myself, I quit worrying about everybody, I quit worrying about all these little Mickey Mouse things that we worry about and get us all tore up and all bent out of shape and we want to, ah! When I'm on that cross, I'm focused. I'm focused. I'm facing one direction. I've made a decision and I've died. I'm not, I don't have any plans of my own. So now my fulfillment comes when I serve others through Christ. That force comes because now Christ is living in me. Wow. You know, I, I sometimes get a, get a, not sometimes, a lot of times, I get a great old kick out of watching some of these guys on television make God out look like he's a serious robot catalog. And by your donations, you can turn to whatever page you want to get what you want. All I can think about is you need to go to a nursing home, go to hospitals, or go to a prison, or go over.
overseas where people have nothing. And bring the Sears catalog with you. God, help me to crawl up on that cross. This year coming up, remember this whole year we, we, we've lost a lot of people through death. And I honestly believe, I told you before, we're in a rebuild mode. And the rebuild is just about complete. And I believe this was the, the capstone series to get us ready. This year coming up is going to be an awesome, awesome year. Y'all guys come and get ready to play something. Say this with me. If you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. Whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. Wow. I discovered that when I'm having a hard time in my life, I'm having hard times with people, having a hard time with whatever, First place I check, I used to check them, tell them what they need. And I quit that. Now what I do is I go back to, to my cross. And I see if I'm on it. Or if I try to put somebody else on my cross. Life will be so much easier if we would quit putting somebody else on our cross and trying to change them and fix them. And you crawl on that cross. Oh yeah, there's a lot of people. I think I got a reason. I got something that'll help them. I got something I can help change in their life. And yeah, but you know what? No. God helped me to crawl on my cross, not put somebody else on it. Not my spouse. Not my children, not church members, and I put myself on my cross. I'm going to crawl up on the cross, a living sacrifice, and watch what you can do. Everybody stand. God is so awesome. He wants to open some doors for this church and open some doors for us collectively and individually that we thought initially were closed or we've never even noticed. But in order for those doors to open, in order for the seed to come up, it's got to go down. The seed must go in the ground and die. And when it comes back, wow, what amazing stuff. Paul said to the Corinthian church, you got to die daily. I discovered my relationships got better with everybody, my wife, my children, work, when I was a partner in Denver, when I was a fountain. I remember a fountain. Good Lord. That place, everybody said, it's his part, it's his part, his part, his part. And my job was to find problems. And it was so terrible. Every day I go in and try to work on problems, and I go talk to somebody, and they go, it's his fault, it's his fault, it's his fault. And I said, look, if you quit pointing fingers, we'll fix this thing. You ain't got to tell me what everybody else did. Just tell me what you've done. All I know is your part. If you tell me your part, I will find out if it's right, if it's wrong, we'll correct it. If it isn't right, wrong, then I'll knock it down as that's one thing that's right. As I go around, quit pointing fingers at everybody and accept your part in this. 
I remember one night I was in, or one day we were in a management meeting. Mr. Fountain was very fired up. He was so angry because somebody had dropped the ball. And so he starts going around the table. As he's going around the table, he says, why is this not fixed? Literally, here's what everybody did. They started to put the person beside them. They put a person beside them. And I knew, 100% knew the reason the project wasn't complete is because it had been handed to me by this engineer manager. I was in charge of one engineer department, he was in charge of another, he had to do his part, was he did his part, he handed it to me, and then I would take care of it. And so there was the vice presidents and all these people, they're all pointing their fingers around the table. When it came to David, going down the table. His name was David too. And so it came time to come to me. And I said, Lord. This is major because he's really mad. And we've really blown it. But I know I did my part. I did everything I could do to him. He handed me over this and after finishing. So what do I do? And the Lord said, just take responsibility for your part and say I'm sorry. So Mr. Fowler said, what do you think, David? I could have easily pointed that guy and said, well, you know what? If he'd have got off his rear end and done something... That's what he was hearing all the way around the table. When it came to me, it was the most amazing thing that day I think I'd ever seen in his management meetings. It came to me. I had the man dead to right. I could have pointed him out. That's the skull that stinks in here. And I said, well, yeah, I got some things that need to be done. I didn't say he, he caused it. I said, I got, yeah, I got, yes. I said, matter of fact, let me just say this. He said, why? I said, I'm sorry. When I said that, I kid you not, jaws started opening. There was a holy hush. Everybody fussing, quit fussing. Everything changed. It wasn't my fault. I was in the clear. It was the guy next to me. If anybody was going to get fired, it needed to be him. This was so important. Military contracts were looking on this. The government was looking at this. He was the one that blew it. But he's pointing at me. And so all I could say was, yeah, there's some things undone. I'm sorry. It got so quiet in there, you could have heard a mouse burn. Nobody said a word. I'm talking about it felt like for hours. It was only for a few minutes, but it felt like hours. Mr. Pound was looking at me, all those vice presidents and all those people, the CEO, the COO, you know, they're all looking at me. And all of a sudden, the vice president engineer looks over at me and goes, we accept your apology. You're forgiven. Let's move on.
Lord, I'm going to crawl up on my cross because that's the only safety I've got now. And I'm going to make a decision. I'm not turning back. I know this is secular work, but they need to see an example set before them. Some of these people really need an example. And that day, when I saw the vice president, just a minute, you know, engineers kind of look at me real weird, like he just swallowed a skunk and then said, We accept your apology. Uh, move on. We never heard that in this meeting before. I've done that not only in that meeting, but I've done that. Time and time again. In all of my relationships, with my family, I've been a time and time again with people in church, people in the neighborhood, people in my own neighborhood.
realize that maybe you're not where you thought you were with God. Or maybe you just need a good old recommit to Him because you need a change. You need something to happen. I'm talking to you right now, every head bowed, every eye closed. You're here and you realize that you're not as close as you thought you were or you need to be closer. Nobody's looking around. I'm not going to make an example out of you. But you put up that hand and say, pray for me, Pastor. I'm not where I should be. I'm not where I want to be. I got other places in my heart and in my spirit. I got to give it to Him. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless Him. Maybe you're here today. And you've been guilty of climbing off your cross and putting somebody else on it. And trying to mold them to shape it. Instead of taking responsibility, you're pushing the responsibility to somebody else. And you occasionally crawl on your cross, but you have other people all the time on your cross. And you know exactly what they need, but you don't think about that they're on your cross, not theirs. But after today, again, Mike's coming on, whistle's going off in your spirit, in your heart, and you begin to realize, hey, I've been guilty as charged. With every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. When they ask this, this is going to take a lot of courage. This is where the healing takes place. This is where the healing starts. This is where the seed goes in the ground. This is where the germination takes place. If you find yourself guilty, number one, either crawl up and down off your cross instead of staying on a living sacrifice, crawl up and down, or you're guilty of putting somebody else on your cross and you're so angry with them because they're not doing what they're supposed to and you don't even realize that's because you've got them on your cross and it's never going to work. It's never going to satisfy you. They're never going to do good enough because you've got them on your cross. With every head bowed, every eye closed, you can say, Pastor, I need you to help me pray that God will help me to take everybody else off my cross and let me get on it and change my focus instead of trying to change theirs. If nobody looked around, every eye closed, would you just slide that hand up? Help me, God, to take people off my cross. It's so liberating. It's so liberating to take people off your cross and you climb on it. Wow. It's amazing. That one meeting at Fountain, out of all the things we did at Fountain, that one meeting, I'd be riding down the road and all of a sudden I hear I hear that little conversation in my head. What you going to do now? What you going to say? You know it's not your fault. You can get fired. What you going to do? And I remember saying to myself, God, help me put an end to this right now. Help me show your glory. And I took responsibility. Not for the whole thing, but I just took responsibility for my part. I said, yeah, my part's not finished. I'm sorry. Uh, because this guy messed up, just, my part's not finished, I'm sorry, and everything changed. I look on their faces. One more time. I'm going to ask. You're willing. Say, God, help me. Take people off my cross. Let me climb up there and be a living sacrifice. Would you just stick with those hands? I want to do this. I got to do this. Let's all pray together. Lord, Lord I thank you that you bore our cross first. You took the pain and the punishment and rescued me from this world. 
Now, God, I need you to rescue me from me. Wow. Help me, Lord, and take people off my cross and climb up with myself and stay there and be your servant. In the name of Jesus, I thank you for it. I thank you for focus. I thank you for fulfillment. And I thank you for that power, that force. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the church said, Amen. Give Lord a hand clap of praise. Celebrating the birth of that child. But that celebration is not complete with just a manger. It becomes complete with the cross. This is the first time I really looked at it this way. But because of his birth and because he did what he did, we're born again. We all have our manger experience. But in order to fulfill what God wants for us, we've got to climb from the manger to the cross. we got to do what our Savior did. And we can do it. Wow. 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 God is so awesome. Come on back next week. We're going to have some awesome stuff. Tuesday night, we're going to have service Tuesday night. By the way, my dad is doing good. He couldn't walk. He passed out every time he stood up after he got his hip replaced. It took him three days to get his blood pressure under control so he could pass it out. He's at home now. And he's like, I want to thank all y'all for praying for him. And he's on a walker. But he, he cleans up and down and he could be driving his truck in a week. I said, Dad, stay from behind the wheel. Until the doctor says you can. He's a hard hit man, not to work. Sound of how I skip me. <laughs> <laughs> it skipped me, but it sure hit him hard. Woo! <laughs> Didn't got good. Oh. Tuesday night. Tuesday night, we're going to finish up. I think we're going to finish up mindfulness, cognitive behavioral therapy. Father God, we thank you for the word that's gone forth this day, Lord. To be mindful, Lord God, to get upon that cross, Lord God. And Lord, take others off, Lord God. Let us be responsible for our own actions. Now, Lord, go with us, be with us. Let peace abound. And, Father, as always, we'll give you the praise, the glory, and honor for it all. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.